Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce a, a very dear friend of mine, Professor Gary Lilienthal. And uh, Gary and I met some time ago. Professor Lilienthal is um, an expert in, what I think, one of the best I've ever heard, who's been working with me on the common law of England, but also looking at how um, uh, the English system and the political systems have been working and how they've been working against us. Professor Lilienthal has written many articles and he's also published many different um, articles, particularly around law and Aboriginal people and rights. And they've been published in various uh, legal journals, uh, particularly here in Australia, the Common, common Law, uh, what do they call it? The, the Commonwealth um, Law Journals. Um, and these things, when they're published in, those, in these journals, are very important because judges have to take notice to them too when, you, when they're quoted. Um, so they cannot be ignored. So they're authority pieces of work. And so without further ado, um, I might also add that Professor Lilienthal is also a rabbi and um, I get some good guidance and wisdom from this gentleman. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see so many people in the class this morning. The questions that Michael raised this morning can be answered in several ways. But the main question he asked is, how do you get rid of this problem? Why is it here? And that's what I want to answer for you this morning. I want to build a scaffolding of understanding that maybe you haven't heard before. And in order to do that, I want to back up a little and tell you about some of my experiences from basically the last 10 years that have taught me many things about this. Now, many years ago, I guess in the last 10 years, I stood in the office of Chairman Mao in his 1926 office in Guangzhou when he led the Peasant Movement Institute, which was the very beginning of his campaign. And the hair on my back stood up as I stood in there. This is a major major, major place to stand. Now this office in the Peasant Movement Institute was only two or three blocks from the ancient palace in Guangzhou of the Nanyue uh, King, who was removed by the armies from Beijing. But the Nanyue Kingdom uh, covered all of South China, all the way down to Hainan. And arguably, the next speaker, Mrs. Elisa Choi, sitting over here, who hails from Hong Kong, Xiangang, she may be a Nan Yue person for all we know. Because all those people are still in place and their culture subsists to this very day. And I'm telling you this for good reasons. So I looked at what Mao Zedong had done and I talked to the people and I looked at what he was teaching in the Peasant Movement Institute. And what he was teaching was uh, he took peasants from all over China and taught them a new imperial seal system. They were secret seals, and there are maps in the institute showing where these people lived in mainland China and who owned what seal. It's the same system the British used in, their, in the history of their monarchy. And the kings communicate with their chief civil servants by secret seals. Otherwise, you don't know whether the information is going to the right person or not. So Mao had studied imperial governance, showing us a continuity from the past. He came from a city in Hunan province, where he was a farmer's son, called, uh, the city was called Changsha. And I went to Changsha. Anybody, anybody here been to Changsha? It's quite a big place, about the size of Sydney. And where he came from was only a mile or so from where the dowager empress Si Tsi came from and her golden robe is still there. Continuity, he was very careful to preserve continuity of these symbols. He lived near the last effective de facto monarch of the Qing dynasty. And the University of Hunan which is in Changsha, is an amazing campus. When I went there, there was a small triangular area of a few hundred meters, 
and in there was a massive statue of Mao Zedong, it must have been 50 metres high. And the students walked by and they were like ants compared to this, this statue. And just over from there, there was a statue about this big of a Chinese folk character called Lei Feng. Now, he was a military figure uh, in the northeast of China and his reputation was doing good deeds. And all that was left of him was a bust of his head on a block and on the block written in Mao Zedong's own handwriting is here lies the head only of Lei Feng. Indicating to us that if you run around doing good deeds everywhere, such as arguably our democracy tries to do, you end up beheaded. And we made a video a few years ago about this in my human capital video about what happens with cricket captains, what happens with all the other officials. The, the head only remains, but there's never a big statue. And behind these two statues at the University of Hunan is a 1,200-year-old book depository called the Yuelu Book Depository, which has ancient manuscripts from the Song and the Tang dynasties. And all the young students from China who are at that university are in that book depository studying these ancient manuscripts, scrolls. You have to, you have to unroll. And there's an old man there who showed me around and he looks after the scrolls and makes sure that nobody smudges coffee on them or tea or dirty fingers and he preserves them. So these symbols are preserved and this is where the Taoist emperor uh, went when at her demise of the Qing dynasty in the 1910s. This is where Mao arose from. So we have a continuity of something here. And then some years later, my wife and I were in Beijing, staying in a back alley hutong hotel with a red door. And we decided we wanted to go to Tiananmen Square. So we took the train to Tiananmen Square Station. That seemed like a reasonable place to go to get to Tiananmen Square. And my wife said to a policeman, which way is Tiananmen Square? And he said, just keep walking until you see the photo of Chairman Mao. So we got to Tiananmen Square, it's not that big. It's, it's not nearly as big as people think it is. And there's this ancient public building, and we know from theories of rhetoric that one of the ways we give value to money is to put a public building on it. One side you'll find a public building, on the other side the head, the disembodied head of a famous person. So that building is called the Gu Gong, Gong meaning public. It's a public building, and it's the major public building of that country. And everybody knows what it looks like with the picture of Chairman Mao on it, which is, looks like an Andy Warhol painting to me. It's kind of stylistic. And so he has his photo on this major public building that emperors have ruled from for centuries. Now with this background, a few years ago, the president of uh, the People's Republic of China, President Xi Jinping, went to Hong Kong. And with an aircraft carrier parked in the harbor in Hong Kong behind him, he stood at the lectern and he spoke to the Hong Kong people and said, Hong Kong has always been in my heart. What flows in the heart? Blood. What color is blood? Red. So in the days of Mao Zedong, there was a song called um, Dong Shu Hong, which means the East is red. And it's very symbolic. They understand the symbolism of that song. And after Xi Jinping spoke in Hong Kong, a little time later, I was in Hong Kong while he was speaking. I was there. I was along a procession route that he was expected to come along, but the riots were starting and he was really angry with them, so he didn't go. But he, he actually conducted from a car, a moving car, an inspection of the People's Liberation Army Hong Kong garrison. 
And he said to them, once every 20 seconds, Hong Chumahal, which means red, is so good. So what he was doing, everybody in China understands what he was doing, we don't get it because of the kind of system we have. But what he was doing was articulating a symbol of sovereignty. So Hong Jamahal, he would articulate to the soldiers and they would answer him and agree with him. But they would agree that indeed red was so good. So I published a paper several years ago in the Richardson School of Law journal in the University of Hawaii about the South China Sea arbitration because everybody said, oh, China disobeys this arbitration. But people don't know, they never attended. They made a submission by a note verbal that our diplomatic friends would understand, one submission by one long note verbal, then they said, we're not participating in this arbitration because under the ancient system of recognition of sovereignty in China, they don't recognize international court decisions because judges to them are incapable of making decisions on sovereignty. The only person who can make a decision on sovereignty is the sovereign. Why would you, gener why would you delegate the making of a sovereign decision to an official who largely has administrative duties? So this is what we have. We have in those countries in the East and in many other countries of the world, sovereignty generated by an exclusive right to articulate the symbols of that sovereignty, the symbols. And Michael was talking earlier on about the flags. Flags are under heraldic international law. Uh, the heraldic treatises say flags are under the law of kings. They're not under the law of the nation. So I'm confused as why our wonderful Prime Minister, Mr. Morrison, is able to transfer ownership of a heraldic device under the Copyright Act. That amazes me. I think maybe either the flag has been stolen or there is no ownership of that flag now, now that the Australian government has intermeddled with the, with the property in the flag. Now, with all that in mind, the problem that Michael raised, how do we see what's going on here and how do we get out of it, is resolved by first understanding that sovereignty is articulated by articulating the primary symbols of sovereignty. And isn't it amazing that Michael's wearing his red headband, red, hong, and he's articulating a special, a special symbol there known amongst the people with whom he mixes and I would say not known amongst the Anglo-Saxons of the country very widely. So we hear also from China, and we heard it from Russia during the Soviet days, that the problem in the world is the encroachment of foreign hegemony. And hegemony is not a new term. I read about hegemony in the Talmud years ago when I was a kid studying in Los Angeles and uh, New York. And the Talmud was redacted 2,000 years ago from the great academies of ancient Jerusalem, and they talked about the hegemony of Syria and all the other countries in that area and of Greece. So hegemony is an ancient concept, and it's recognized today in the eastern countries that they're being attacked by hegemony. Now, what I want to do with you today is build a scaffolding all the way down from the basic tropes that are fed to us instead of Hong Jumahal. Other, other tropes that come up are tropes like uh, turn back the boats. Why? And so in a moment, I'm going to play a 15 minute video to you and I'll set the background as to how these tropes work, how they generate ideology, the ideology of the British ruling class is expressed in their laws. So all those laws Michael went through this morning are statements of British ideology. Once we understand that, then we can see what part of society implements that ideology uh, 
to create a consent among what they think are subaltern masses, lower levels like you and I, not exalted people like them, and that the hegemony formed from this is a consent to be ruled which can't be broken, which means that when Michael sets up a tent embassy in 1970, what year was it? 1972, that um, basically nothing can change. And here we are all these years later and it's still there and nothing's been achieved because hegemony with all its contradictions is completely stable, which is why nobody wants it in their country. So ladies and gentlemen, I invite you now to watch this very nice 15 minute video recorded by Ellie and the star of the video is me, recorded in the National Botanical Gardens in Canberra and while we were recording it, a very nice young woman who was a ranger came to us and said, what right have you to speak to a camera in my national park? <laughs> we have a statute that prohibits that unless you ask permission. I'd just been talking about this kind of thing. My mind began to spin. <laughs> and if it weren't for the fact that Ellie cautioned me not to say anything, because I was in a very bad mood, the young woman may have exercised her statutory authority and removed us from the park. Isn't that right, Ellie? Lucky thing you stepped in. So I invite you to watch the video. May, uh, would you play the video, please? Hello, I'm Gary Lilienthal, and I'm here today to discuss with you some of the modern applications in political propaganda of the ancient Greek rhetoric. Let's call this talk Spin and Doublespeak, the rotation of the master tropes. And by the way, as I begin, I want to tell you that I'm aware that many people have counseled their children to lift up their words and find the meanings underneath. This is especially required when we are assaulted by professional propagandists in the corporate media, for example, using rhetoric against us. But what is rhetoric? Rhetoric is technically defined as the art of using language either to persuade or to influence other people. It is the body of rules a speaker or writer had to follow for expression with maximal eloquence. This meant rhetoric was, on the one hand, the ability to create an event, and on the other hand, a mandatory code requiring obedience. Now we understand what rhetoric is, but what is a trope? A trope is part of rhetoric. A trope is the conversion of a word or phrase from its proper meaning to another in order to increase its force. The word trope derives from the Greek tropos, meaning turn. Thus, a trope turns the sound of a word from one meaning to another. This happens all the time between languages. For example, the English word chu sounds like the Chinese word chu, which means eat. Next, let's look at some examples and definitions of the tropes. Let's start with the four master tropes, the first of which is metaphor. Metaphor is a trope in which a word or phrase is applied to an object or action to which it is not really applicable. Let me give you some examples. Care and protection, that's a metaphor. It indicates genocide through child removal from the group. Here's another one. We don't own the land, the land owns us. That's a metaphor for dispossession. Deaths in custody. That's a legal metaphor for state-sanctioned killings. Little children are sacred. Yes, they are. But the report, the little children are sacred, was used as the basis of the Northern Territory military intervention. Here's another one. Laughter is the best medicine. And we know that laughter is not medicine. She is just a late bloomer, as if she were a flower. Is there a black sheep in your family? 
as if members of your family were mere sheep. His heart of stone surprised me. We know that heart is flesh and it can't be stone. I smell success in this building. He's buried in a sea of paperwork. There is a heavy weight on my shoulder. Time is money. What is time? Once we understand what time is, only then can we see whether or whether or not it is money. But let me assure you, time is certainly not money. The second of the master tropes is metonymy. You may, have not, may not have heard of that before. Metonymy is a trope substituting the name of an attribute for that of the thing meant. For example, suit for business executive or the turf for horse racing. Let's look at some more examples. The metonymy uh, used in the word the crown for the attribute of power of a king or queen. The White House referring to the attribute of American administration. Dish to refer to the food arrangement on an entire plate of food. The Pentagon, you've all heard about the Pentagon. It's a big, big building just outside of Washington, D.C. It's a metonymy for the American Department of Defense and the offices of the United States Armed Forces. We also see this in ancient Egypt, where Egyptian gods were actually the names of government departments. Here's another one. Pen for written persuasion. Sword for military force. Hollywood for the physical site of movie studios in Los Angeles. Although I must tell you that when I lived in Los Angeles, I noticed that the biggest movie studios were not in Hollywood. They were in Culver City, which is many miles away, many kilometers away. Here's another one. Hand for someone's action. This is my hand, but the metonymy hand indicates somebody has acted, such as acting with a dead hand. Now let's move to the third of the four master tropes. Synecdoche. Interesting word, isn't it? Synecdoche. Synecdoche is a trope in which a part is made to represent the whole or vice versa, as in Australia lost by six wickets meaning the Australian cricket team. They say Australia instead of the Australian cricket team. Here's another one. Boots on the ground describes soldiers. New wheels describes a new car. Ask for her hand describes the asking of a woman to marry. Now we're all familiar with holding a woman's hand and only in a very small number of cases does holding her hand mean you're marrying her. But it, that's the way the synecdoche works. Suits, S-U-I-T-S, describes business people. She or he is a suit. Plastic describes credit cards. Are you going to play with your plastic? Pay with your plastic? That's a synecdoche. Canberra describes statements made by officials within the Australian government. Canberra said today, and you don't know who the faceless person is who's actually doing the same. Now, the fourth and final master trope is irony, and it's so important because this is how people are controlled using rhetoric. Irony is the expression of meaning by using language that normally signifies the opposite, typically for emphatic effect. Some examples, land improvement equals land clearing, which leads to scorched earth policy, a military issue, uh, ecocide and monoculture. Sustainable diversion limits, that's water theft by irrigators. Bringing them home. Home is into the colonial system. The Uluru, Uluru Statement, now Statement from the Heart, leads to assimilation and disempowerment. A fire station burns down. That's irony. A marriage counsellor files for divorce. 
That's another case of irony, isn't it? The police station gets robbed. A post on Facebook complains about how useless Facebook is. So you can see that in irony, the fact that it's the reverse of the original meaning can be used in rhetoric to get something uh, communicated to people so that they will agree to the reverse of what they think they are agreeing to. Here's another one. A traffic cop gets his license suspended because of unpaid parking tickets. We see these kinds of articles all the time in the news. A pilot, an aircraft pilot, suffers a fear of heights. So this explains in definitional form the four master tropes. First, metaphor. Second, metonymy. Third, synecdoche. And fourth, irony. Next, we'll see how they work together. That's up next. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk about the rhetoric of the rotational metaphor. Whoa, what does that mean? Very simply put, it means the four most master tropes turn from one to the other in a circular rotational pattern and you get the rhetoric of the rotational metaphor, starting with a metaphor and ending with irony where people have been uh, confused. So one of the most striking and least examined aspects of this four trope series, the four master tropes of G.M. Battista Vico in the 1660s and Kenneth Burke in the 1940s, is their inherent movement through a fixed course from metaphor, the preliminary naming operation, to metonymy, the process of formalization, to the descriptive relationships of synecdoche, to the final awareness within the series that all of its processes have been tropic turns. The whole process turning out to be ironic, the opposite of what people expected. What do I mean? Well, this is actually a corruption of Plato's rotational metaphor, his original rotational metaphor, exp expressed in his seventh letter. This seventh letter explains the development of knowledge, starting with name, definition, description, then the emotional satisfaction of knowledge. So you can see now how the seventh letter has been turned into a device for creating incorrect knowledge. Let's look at some examples. It is this precise order of the four-trope system which constitutes in a suitably developed form, the narrativity of the human mind. We develop from facts that we perceive a narrative in our mind. It creates a narrative within our minds that we act on. We see this level of public programming, for example, in the phrase, rolling out the vaccine. It sets up the public unconscious mind to accept the onset of a rotational metaphor. This is all very deliberate in public propaganda. Thus, an orator, a person skilled in public oratory, public speech, might make a general statement, a metaphor, and the audience themselves might consequently and necessarily synthesize an ironic outcome. For example, getting the jab in your arm results in de facto media advocacy of vaccine hesitancy because the public mind associates the jab or being hit with a jousting pole with being injured rather than being vaccinated. None of us knows the real truth on this topic. Turns out that the word jab actually means getting hit by a jousting pole. Also, the phrase, turn back the boats, is grounded in the idea of human traffickers being terrible people who should be stopped and jailed if possible. But the ironic result is that innocent civilians are confronted on the high seas and often drowned during this military confrontation. 
while the so-called human trafficker might only be a 19-year-old Indonesian small boat captain merely carrying out an agreement to ferry people to another place. This is a modern version of the ancient ferry driver who ferries the passengers across the river, in the ancient myth it's the river Styx, in exchange for the payment of a silver coin. But in this case, there is a serious violation of the Geneva Conventions on War that provides that military actions must not be carried out against non-combatant civilians. You see how war criminals can act under statutory authorization and nobody seems to worry. The most egregious example I can think of is the idea of protecting people where the protector has the power to seize their bodies into custody, inspect their bodies and fence them in so they can't escape from protection. Finally, the very idea of an imported religion, imported from the other side of the world, must be some kind of suspicious event. The use of the metaphor of father and son to create a deified control system for workers is a particularly wrongful use of the inherent deceit of rhetoric to reduce people into servitude as sheep following the shepherd. See the ultimate irony? I look forward to explaining this process in detail and demonstrating to you how it works by deceptively thwarting the natural powers of reasoning inherent in all good and decent people. Good. Let's put it together very quickly. We have a rotational metaphor. Metaphor, metonymy, synecdoche, synecdoche and irony. The mind automatically, when it hears a metaphor, rotates catastrophically between each of them. Whenever you hear a metaphor, your mind ends up in irony. Freud said in his later discussions that metaphor and metonymy constitute the way the mind dreams. That's the dream work or the primary process of the mind. Which means when someone hurls at you a metaphor, you enter a process of dreaming, sometimes known as hallucination. Let's see how this works in practice. The idea of ideology is to develop a narrative in your mind that is not based on social fact outside your body. It's based only on your internal thoughts. In fact, the scholars said that ideology is developing a narrative entirely based upon a false consciousness, hallucinatory dream. So once you have people believing these ideologies, such as, for example, China is bad, even though they never went there, which never ceases to amaze me because it's such a huge country and so complex and has so many different facets. You couldn't possibly say it's bad. There's bad things and good things and things in between. So these ideologies can be created. Now, who creates these ideologies? We don't know, and as I talked to my colleagues, they all said, who's doing it? Well, it's the, it's the mandarins of the culture, the anthropologists, the historians, the politicians, advisors, inevitably for this country in London and Washington, D.C., and they create these. At the French Revolution, the king's head was chopped off. So the bourgeoisie, the middle class, became the ruling class, and that same things happened in, in most of the European cultures. The process of kingship continues with the mandarins who used to advise the king. But now the bourgeoisie 
has the job of using that kind of ideological rhetoric and convincing the masses that it's sufficiently true for them to consent to being ruled by the middle class, the bourgeoisie. Who is the bourgeoisie? That's another thing my colleagues overseas asked me when I was going through this. So I looked at the prison notebooks of Antonio Gramsci, who was locked up in Mus Mussolini's prison for reasoning the way we're reasoning here today. And it turns out the bourgeoisie is three groups of people. Number one, the entrepreneurs. Number two, the government accredited professionals, lawyers, accountants, doctors, etc. And number three, the managers. Those three groups together operate a system called hegemony that all the Eastern countries I explained earlier on don't want on their shores. And here's how hegemony works. You hurl at the people uh, metaphors which makes the people dream up guided ideologies. These ideologies are designed to make it look like the bourgeoisie is giving up some of its inherent rights and giving them to the masses to be good guys to them. And then the subaltern masses, like you and me, think, seems good. I've got a car, I've got a job, I've got, I can go to the supermarket, I can get all brand. I can get very nice products and, and I can, uh, I've got a house with a driveway and a mortgage and that's my life and I could continue this system so long as I consent to bourgeois rule. And what happens when the people begin to withdraw this consent as they are at the moment all over the Western world is that the bourgeoisie intervenes juridically they send the police, they sue people, they uh, litigate criminally against people, charge people with treason, uh, and they, they oppress them physically until they're forced back into consent. So there it is. You've basically got the tropes that you saw in the video, creating ideology that is used by the middle class, those three groups of people, to convince people to consent to rule against their own interests. And there it is. Are there any questions? One question in the back. The media is used by the bourgeoisie to transmit the ideology. That's their job. Ah, how to break it? Well, that's a problem, isn't it? Because as soon as you withdraw your consent, all the coercive powers come down on you. So how do you do it? I think it should be broken way back at the metaphors. You stop paying attention to the media, simply don't look at it. Ignore the jab business. Uh, Mrs. Elisa Choi sitting here is a data analyst. She analyzed the effect of that word jab and she found out that it had a, a causal link to vaccine hesitancy. So you had a false conscious, consciousness about vaccination, which they were using to either instill fear or lock people up in their homes, and then you get more hegemonic rule. So uh, to answer your question, I believe you've got to nip it in the bud in the, at the source. You have to sever a relationship with the media. Any more questions? I'm glad to see this has sunk in. I'm very gratified. <laughs> What's that? Double speak. Double speak, yeah. Okay, that concludes my remarks. Thank you very much. Double speak? Oh, double speak is, is simply uh, a form of ideology. That's all it is. It's either a, a metaphor, a metonymy, a synecdoche, or whatever. You say one thing, but you mean another. You're lying to people. And the way you do that is by 
you know, the, these metaphors are used when they don't need to be used. I mean, I looked at this in China. I, I said to my friends in China, what are they saying in China on the media about vaccinations? And the word for vaccination in China is email. And what are they saying in China? Email. They're not talking about jousting competitions or jabs or shots or anything like that. They say vaccination. There is no metaphor being used. And it doesn't need to be used here either because we all understand the word vaccination. So it's being used for some other purpose. Yes. Well, look, he's just doing a good job of hegemonic rule. He's a, he's a textbook case of somebody from the bourgeoisie ruling like a bourgeois ruler. He is certainly not a sovereign. I think so. I think he's, look, nobody can criticise him for that. That's what he's supposed to do, and he's done it. They're the same. This premier in New South Wales the child premier from KPMG, decided that everyone should get sick. So did everything he could for people to get sick. Whew. I mean, I, I can't even apply my mind to it. I don't know which way to think on that. Yeah, I'm just wondering where the word prison would fall in, yeah, in the tropes, because prison's a concept that's used as a language, but a prison isn't a prison of the mind. It's so, yeah, I'm just wondering, yeah, how... Well, Bentham how we wrote a whole treatise on the prison, didn't he? Yeah. Is that what you're referring to? Say again. Bentham, Jeremy Bentham, wrote an entire treatise on the concept of the prison. I'll have to read it. And he basically said that it's a particular kind of building that was designed to oppress you without even having any guards there. Yeah, because I feel like the prison concept was largely debunked 50 years ago as well with the Stanford Prison Experiment. It's also the 50th anniversary of that experiment this year. So pretty much it just is, yeah. Um, so your question is, what's the significance of the prison? Yeah, or if, if I was to, yeah, spend some time thinking about the tropes and how we can reconceptualise prison in rhetoric. It, it well, it fits in what hegemony does when people withdraw consent. You start throwing them into prison. Yeah. And if the, yeah, if the people didn't want the tax money to pay for prisons and to withdraw consent. Well, which person wants to pay taxes to fund prisons? Hopefully no one here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your insightful questions. I can't, I can't hear the question. I know you're asking about the rotational metaphor. That's what all I know. What about using metaphor and irony itself to um, deconstruct all oh, those things? Oh, because if you went straight to irony, you'd be, you'd be the guilty party. So you do the metaphor, and then you can just stand back and relax, and the human mind just goes cook, 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 down to irony, and, and the people on the high seas, I don't know whether you know, but it, the international law is that we all have freedom to sail any boat we like on the high seas. That's international law. I don't know why the Australian Navy, run by a general and not an admiral, and which general got promoted to chief of defence forces for being a very good taker of orders, I don't know why they're there intercepting people exercising their international law right to sail on the high seas. Because the Australian population has it in their minds that these people are illegal. And they're not. They're lawfully, legally sailing on the high seas. So turn back the boats is a wonderful metaphor. They even put the word turn in there to trigger the rotational metaphor for you. It's brilliantly worked out. And there's lots of them like that. Now, uh, Vossius, uh, back 500 years ago, fully deconstructed this, and I did publish a paper on this, and it's highly unsuitable for deconstruction in public today. It's very technical. 
but it works automatically every time. Yes, ma'am. I'm wondering whether it works automatically every time, as you say, is because we, Western society is based on the Greek system and whether, for example... Based on what? The Greek system, the rhetorical system, and whether um, all of us automatically complete that cycle, for example, there's a lot of Aboriginal people in here today, whether without the influence of colonisation would Aboriginal people be thinking the same way? Well, Western society is based upon um, self-government by ethical deliberation. You separate virtues from vices, like Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics said, and you work out the bad parts and the good parts, and out of this you generate a golden mean. But according to the scholars, Western society has entered a late stage where the ability to separate virtues from vices has collapsed. And ethics in Western society is now just assessing whether something's good for me or not. Now, this separation of all the people into separate and non-community members, but separate people, is a byproduct of hegemony. So the person now says, if it's good for me, it's ethically good. And of course, you know, your society can collapse if you make decisions that way. You don't make decisions for your children that way. You consider things very carefully when you're discussing things with your children. You don't just consider if the child feels good that everything's great, otherwise they'll end up on drugs for the rest of their lives. And that's what happens. Now, I just want to ask the question about native title. Native title, yeah. And where does that leave us? Because all the constructs for native title are made by non-Aboriginal people and all the hoops that we have to jump through to, you know, to get our native title. Yeah, native title is, uh, is, a, is founded on a decision of the High Court in Mabo where they said that native title is, is based on use you fractuary title without explaining what that was. Now, there's two forms of use you fractuary title. One, the kind that's used in Sudan to this very day. That's why I was looking forward to the Sudanese ambassador coming. And the other one that I read about when I was in, in learning in the rabbinic colleges in Los Angeles so many years ago. And going to the last one first, if a woman has a grove of fruit trees and wants to get married because the work to maintain that grove is too much for her, it's physically unacceptable, physically untenable for her to maintain this massive grove of fruit trees. She gets married, marries the husband. The husband is physically stronger otherwise she wouldn't marry him because she's got a fruit grove. And, and the use of fructuary title is that if he looks after the fruit grove, then although she retains capital ownership of it, he gets the ownership of the fruit, provided he picks the fruit, he maintains the trees, he takes the fruit to market, generates the income from the sales of the fruit and sustains the family with it. So that's use you fructuary title as existed in ancient times. In modern Sudan, because I've written about use you fructuary title there in the last few years, they have a statute that says all the farmers are allowed to farm the land along the rivers. This is riparian title. And the main river there in Sudan is the, the Nile comes from Ethiopia, the Blue Nile and the White Nile from whatever country south of there. And they meet in Khartoum, and then the water goes down into Egypt and sustains Egypt. So those farmers are allowed to, so that's the fertile areas along the river, the riparian land. The farmers are allowed to farm those lands and they must continue to farm, but if they stop farming, like take a break for six months, they lose the land, which is, very tyrannical. 
And I believe that the High Court was referring to the Sudanese model because I don't think it's within the High Court's intellect to understand the other model of the people coming together and forming a union so that they could run the farm. Does that answer that question adequately for you? So native title is a false concept. It was never founded on those kinds of usufructory titles. In the paper I published on the Australian song lines, it was clear to me that the land title system is set out through ancient transmission of concepts and rules maintained by a memory in the people using the usual method used all around the world by indigenous people of song and dance and ritual and this is called the ritual statute system. When the British got to Hong Kong, they sent out all these judges to investigate, and by the way, some stupid judge said in Hong Kong after they took over in 1841, we have here a situation of terra nullius, he said in 1841, when there were 10,000 Hong Kong people walking the streets, and it was a city a city, and he's sitting in a court, and he says, oh, it's terra nullius, nobody's here. So they're apt to do that. And uh, the, the playbook they used with Hong Kong is the same playbook they're using with Australia. And what the government in Beijing has done is basically said, anyone who is against the country uh, can't be in charge. And that's what they've done, and they've, they've removed, they've recently removed the head of the Hong Kong Bar Association, who was a British politician living in Britain and who was a member of parliament for the Liberal Democratic Party. Hello? I mean, it wouldn't put, I wouldn't put it past them to do that here too, put somebody in charge who's actually living in Britain. And that's what they've got to get rid of in Hong Kong. It's, it, as I said to Michael many times, it's, it's a case of Moses in the desert. What's he going to do? They're in the desert, all 613,000 of them, and they're complaining that they can't eat fish and cucumber anymore. So he decides, leave them in the desert for 40 years and let the grandchildren run things. And that's what they were facing in Beijing, what to do. That's why they've got a 50-year policy. That's why taking over here is not going to be... Michael says it can happen very easily, and that's true. But Deng Xiaoping said, when Hong Kong came back to China, he said, oh, there's going to be problems here. And I think there would be problems here too. You'd have to put something in place very strong to keep things under control. <laughs> yeah, Melissa here. Um, I also um, I work for Koori Radio, and I was just wondering if you had any advice oh, okay. for me as an Aboriginal person who works in the media. Mm. Um, you know, just like any advice from you would be um, thoughtful and helpful. Well, look, we're speaking frankly today, aren't we? Yes. And I don't know what you can say on the media. I wouldn't. If I were you, I'd uh, I'd feel. Look, my daughter's in the media. She's a journalist. She's a very intense girl, far too intense for me. She keeps on telling me that I'm not listening closely to her. Why are you phasing out, she says, as she directs all this intensity to me. But she, she's ended up in investigative journalism so that she can get facts. She doesn't write any ideology. She won't cop that. She doesn't like politicians. She told me that. She just pieces the facts together and uh, reverse engineers a state of affairs. I think that's all you can do. Yeah, thanks. That's 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 been my my um, that's process you've, at That's where you you've reached that as well. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks well, so much. That's where she's time. reached. She's probably similar age to you. Yeah, great. Mm. Thank you so much. Thanks. You're welcome. Would anybody else like to ask a question? Sandra, um, my dad's Norwegian, but I was born at Woi Woi. Everything to do with the laws. Um, has all got to do with the word, hasn't it? And all of this um, hermogy, um, masters, tropes, it's all got to do with language and everything. It's Masonic law as well, to which you're dealing with Cambry, wanting to speak to you as a rabbi. There's Masonic laws and everything as well that are on here, so that's why the word must be 
perfected and translated correctly because, you know, everything great. So how do we take on a government that plays with... Um, so what's the we crux of the question? We have very aware, don't we, very aware of the words. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. And the yeah, mind, yeah. because that was the end of the... <coughs> um, instead of coming back, back to irony, if you have um, meditation, contemplation of the mind, then you can create a, a greater ideology as well. Well, we get... In the rabbinic system of legal interpretation, we get around that by not having statutes. There's no statutes in rabbinic law. There are several hundred central concepts. And we learn all the concepts, and ra rather than learn statements of law, we learn the debates that were had in the Great Academy thousands of years ago. And the debate proceeds through all this claim and counterclaim and rebuttal and rejoinder and everything, and depending upon the facts of the situation before you, you, you can interpret in accordance with a partial stoppage in the debate because the facts that take it to the end are not there. And then if you're stupid enough to do that in public, somebody says, but you decided that she could do it, why, why can't I do it? And you can't explain to them that the, that the debate's different because of the different social facts. So, I was, I was ordained as a rabbinic judge. I sat on the, the Jewish court in New York and did nine and a half thousand cases. And it's wonderful there because the whole population understands all this stuff in New York. These are people like you who go back thousands of years and have this culture and you're talking to your own people. Whereas here, you are not. I mean, you know, you... How do you advise them? I don't know. My next door neighbor used to be Morrison's speechwriter. And she moved in and she said to me, oh, she said, I have an Italian stove in the kitchen and all Italian stoves explode. So I have to get the tradesmen to remove it. And I have to stand there and treat her like she's a rational human being. Then she said, I had, to prep, I had to rip up all the floor. It didn't feel good to walk on. And she's spending thousands on all this. I haven't ripped up my floor yet or thrown away my stove. Everything seems fine. <laughs> but she wrote speeches for Morrison. Depends upon the circumstances, which is why ideology is no good, because it, it's a narrative not based in socially verified fact which is why my daughter feels comfortable in her journalist job because it's investigative journalism and she's constantly verifying real socially based fact. That she's had to wait 20 years into her career to get that. As a white Australian, I was very moved and inspired this morning from your presentation, Michael. Thank you very much. I really learned a lot and that's just really sinking in and is changing a lot of my way of seeing things, um, taking on your story and what you've achieved. I'd like to ask, through your particular lens, um, what would you say about the way Michael's gone about being successful on his journey, on his path with his community, that you can see... What would I say about Michael's path? Yes, through your... through this... Well, I'm not an opponent. What would you <laughs> say has made him be successful? And what do you see is... Um, uh, look. ...relevant for other yeah, people trying to do something similar? Like, how do we apply what you're saying to actually the topic at hand that he's well, been talking Well, look, about. let me tell you my perspective. My, my grandparents came to this country in 1880, both sides of the family, and they came to Sydney. So I was born in Sydney. And uh, because they could see what was going on in Europe, in, even in the 1880s, they could see what was going to happen in the 1930s and 40s, they got out. 
They were right ahead of the game, but one of my great-grandfathers ran a very large newspaper in Eastern Europe and ran all the Hitler arguments for many years and all the opposing arguments, and he was very uh, rational. He ran all the arguments, but they killed him anyhow. And so I come from that background, and then what I see here is that there's perfectly sweet kids being jailed for nothing for a law that doesn't apply to them. And that sounds to me a hell of a lot like a major epic injustice that won't wash out for thousands of years because I know how long these things last. As I said before, I talked about Moses. That's thousands of years ago. We're still talking about it. And this uh, government death squad stuff that's going on here at the moment will be talked about thousands of years from now. How do you stop it? You, you stop it the same way they've always stopped it in the past. You, you sever the link with the, uh, with the sovereign and create a new sovereign. And that's done by articulating the symbols of sovereignty no matter what. They're busy creating dream states so that people throw out their stove because it's going to explode. That's why I told you about that. But you have a, you have a system based upon uh, cosmology and observation of the stars. It's rationally based. Just articulate the symbols. One of the things that I, I didn't address this morning was the fact that um, all our artwork and the engravings on the rock and the fact that at home they cut down 100 and, uh, 245 trees which were all the symbols of the Ualiai uh, Gomoroi people. And these symbols are what Gary referred to exactly. as the uh, ritual statues, right? So the white fellas learned very early to destroy the sites of Aboriginal people because we may not have, they say we don't have written text. That's not true. Those artwork and their etchings on the rocks right throughout the desert all the, all the dendroglyphs in our country that they cut down and took away, that's our ritual statutes. They're our stories. That's our connection to land. Through uh, the celestial laws, because we all talk about stars, every tribe talks about the stars, and they bring that down onto Earth, and that is the highest, as, as Gary says, that's the highest law that you can get. Yeah, that's celestial law. And we have that carved in rocks, we have it painted in caves, we have it etched in, in, on trees in the dendroglyphs. And so that ritual statute, that's why they're still attacking it, that's why they're cutting them down, that's why they're defacing all our, our artwork and all those things, because they need to get rid of that, those pieces of artwork, because that's our statute law, and that's the highest law in this land, and it supersedes anything they make up there in paper. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you an example. I made full professor in Ethiopia. I took a job in Ethiopia and I applied for an associate professor's job and they, the contract said professor. So I thought, cool, I'll take it. A promotion. And when I got there, I got out at the airport in Gondar, which is the ancient imperial capital of Ethiopia, and, and I was on a, one of those vans where half a dozen people are going into, into town in Gondar. It was about a one-hour drive from the airport. And I couldn't help noticing all over the countryside two things. One, it's extremely dry. You couldn't grow anything there. And two, there's prickly pear everywhere. Now, I said to the people on the bus, one of them was a, uh, had a PhD in agricultural science, Dr. Assefa, still a friend of mine, and he said, it was introduced from Australia and it's destroyed the land and the farmers are using the prickly pear because there's no building materials. They're using it to build their huts because it makes good wood to build huts and they know that the cure to pr prickly pear, which is some kind of moth, I understand, a white moth, they won't import it because they won't have anywhere to live and they can't grow anything. So it's not much different to what they're doing here. 
Those are the games that are played. The other thing I noticed at there is that as I walked in the streets of Gondar, there are young women sitting in the gutters with little baskets this big with limes in them. And that's how they make a living. They'll sell a half a dozen limes a day for a very small amount of money. And while I'm standing there talking to her, negotiating the price for a lime that I can take back to my hotel room, a dirty big Coca-Cola truck goes vroom right by and kicks up the dust in our faces. Um, look at the irony. The irony is unbelievable. That they've got all this poison there destroying these people and they say, oh, that's, that's not a good country. That's a poor country. And it's because there's a war going on against them. It's, everything's been stolen from them. The other thing I noticed is that there are hundreds of indigenous groups in that country. They have 120 million people there in that country. And I got to be friends with a colleague of mine at the university. And he was teaching uh, human rights law. And he was with the Kemant indigenous group, Q-E-M-A-N-T. And they have a provision in their constitution so long as they follow the steps in that provision in the federal constitution, that indigenous group can gain rights in the legislature, in Addis Ababa, and other rights in society like everyone else. There's no provision like that in the Australian constitution. It didn't even enter their minds. They never intended to. All they, all they intended to do was keep on uh, destroying people's rights. And research I've done over the years shows that the destruction of people's rights creates depression and other mental diseases. So that's, that's kinetic war. That's a classic definition of kinetic acts of war. Okay, that concludes my remarks. Thank you very much. <laughs>